Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Ikonomu, composer of the DreamWorks animated feature film, Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken. And you're joining me here today in my home studio to do a cue breakdown from one of the pinnacle scenes from the film. We're gonna talk about what it's like to score for animation, collaborating with filmmakers, working with live soloists and incorporating them in your compositional process, and many, many more things. So let's dive in, shall we? Pun intended. So for those of you who have not seen Ruby Gilman Teenage Kraken, Ruby belongs to a family of Krakens and they live in the town of Oceanside among humans and nobody knows that they're Krakens. Now Ruby has been told her entire life by her mother not to go in the water because there are too many dangerous things in there and they pose a threat to Kraken. So she has developed this sort of phobia of water. Now when she inevitably ends up in the water to dive after her crush to save him, she discovers that she turns into a giant Kraken. Now, she doesn't know that this is going to happen. There's only three giant Kraken in the world. Her, her mother, and her grandmother, who is royalty. She is queen of the Kraken. Ruby is sort of fighting her in this internal battle about how she just wants to be an ordinary teenager, but then she finds out that she's been lied to her whole life. So it's a real struggle with her identity. You know, who is she? Who is she meant to be? And it's this beautiful thing where she embraces what's different about her. She embraces the uniqueness of being a giant kraken and really harnesses that as her superpower. And she goes on to save Oceanside. So this scene that I have chosen to share with you today is really uh, an important moment for Ruby because it's the first time that she chooses to dive in the water of her own volition. And so she's essentially taking this big risk. She doesn't quite know what's going to happen other than turning into a giant kraken. But it's this wonderful moment where she embraces who she truly is. And that is, there's so much beauty in that. So there's a lot of shifts, twists, and turns in the scene, which is especially why I wanted to share it with you. And um, let's take a closer look. Land is not built for a giant kraken. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's not. I don't know the first thing about being a giant kraken. It's not fair to keep me in the dark. Nope, not at all. I can't keep waiting for answers. I need to take control of my own life. You go, girl. I'm a kraken. Preach. And if I want answers, then there's only one person who can help me. Your mom. My Grandmother. Yeah. No, what? I can't let you do that. Oh. Your mom will kill me. Ah. Ah. <sighs> Uncle Brill, you have been more helpful than you can imagine. <sighs> you know, this is the first hug we've had in 15 years. Then I'm really sorry. <laughs> For what? This. Oh, a stick snack! the stick trick, I admit that, but whoa. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. So there's no way I'm getting you out of the water now, is there? Okay, so that's the scene. That's the final dub version of it. I wanna give you a little bit of context about what it was like to start scoring this film. I got hired to do Ruby about a year before we actually recorded the orchestra at Abbey Road. So I was hired pretty early. The directors, Kirk D'Amico and Farron Pearl, and the producer, Kelly Cooney, they were my main collaborators for the whole duration of the project. So very early on, they gave me a script before I even had the first meeting with them. And I really fell in love with the characters. Ruby just really came off the page. So for some reason, when I was reading the script, the idea of dream pop came in my head. Um, 
just because I think the washy sort of uh, reverby guitars and and vocals and like really compressed percussion and all of that stuff that just reminds me of being underwater. So it was something I wanted to explore. I brought it up to them and they said, yeah, sure, go for it. Ruby's theme, I really wanted, well, it needed to be able to capture what it's like to be a teenager. And I think the dream pop kind of did that. So does indie pop as well, I think. So it was, when she's on land, I was kind of leaning more into an indie pop palette. Then when she goes underwater or is near the water, it leans more dream pop. So I wanted to share this with you so you could sort of recognize what Ruby's theme sounds like. So here we go. So that's Ruby's theme on those guitars there. That was the very first sort of context that I gave it. Um, and then here's another place where I used it in that same theme suite. So again, using it on guitars, um, there are some string colors in there. So I was starting to experiment with what is that blended hybrid world of this kind of dream pop, indie pop, synth pop with orchestra going to sound like. Um, both of those clips that you just heard, parts of that ended up as cues in the film. So that's always a very nice thing when that happens. Here's the last iteration of Ruby's theme in the theme suite. This is um, sort of a, more of an evolution of the theme, I would say. It's kind of a variation of it. So essentially that's Ruby's theme. Um, and it does go through various iterations. Um, I wanted to be able to evolve it. I wanted people to hear it at the beginning of the movie in this very teenage sort of lens. And something very interesting happened when I did that. So putting up some of this dream pop music to Ruby's everyday life as a teenager made it feel like a John Hughes movie. So it really captured the sense of like 80s nostalgia and I think what we used to love about those sort of romantic movies from the 80s. Um, it was it was a cool dynamic when we actually put it up to picture and we were like, something's happening here. It was it was great. And that doesn't always happen right out of the gate. So I was fully prepared to just ditch this idea entirely and start over, but very happy that I got to explore this space. So going back to the top, I just want to talk about general ideas for spotting um, thoughts that I had for this when I was writing. Now at the very top here. Land is not built for a giant dragon. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's not. I don't so just right there, I'm going to mute our guides for right now just so we can kind of focus on the music. Right there is just this sort of yearning, right? I, I had these rich string chords because she's sort of staring off into the distance. She feels very torn between these ocean waves that she's hearing and Oceanside, who she is as a teenager with her family and who she is discovering she really is deep down. So I thought these chords plus her theme, Ruby's theme on the horn, was kind of offering that sense of yearning and longing. Now when we get to the next phrase here. Little snippet of Ruby's theme. Now these electric, washy electric guitar chords. I really wanted it to be like the sea is calling to her, right? So she, all of these lights are, are going up on the dock and she's she feels this mag magnetic pull towards it. So that's what I really wanted. I wanted it to sort of start building for her um, in this moment. And so we have those beautiful guitars. The guitars are a very, very big part of this score. And we're gonna talk to the guitarist, John Monroe, about 
the things he recorded and how we collaborated together on this. But his guitar chords are mixed with orchestra, big strings, um, as well as the this rubber bridge guitar, which he's going to bring in and show you, and some synths. So there's a lot of uh, sort of throwback kind of analogy sounding synths. Uh, retro synths in this score that follow Ruby around, which also gives it this kind of dream pop sound. And then here's a little trick that I wanted to share with you guys. I'm sure this is something many, many composers do, but I thought it was a fun thing to share with you. Whenever I have something, especially string chords that are quite rich and I want it to have that kind of impact, I always like to layer it with like a round bass sound underneath the chords. So for example, I'm just gonna isolate the string chords here. Great on their own, right. But what happens if we take a sound like this, a very warm, sort of rounded, almost sine wavy kind of bass tone, and put that in with the strings? Just gives it a sense of weight and warmth. Now, I like to do this in a lot of um, sort of emotionally rich sections like this with strings. Oftentimes I'll double that with um, an upright bass or a pizzicato bass section. Uh, that sort of accomplishes the same thing, but I love incorporating this, this sort of round based tone underneath everything. It's the underpinning and it sort of just like hits you right in the gut, which makes things feel more emotional to me. Now, as you guys notice, there's this fun little wind down um, when she sort of tricks Uncle Brill, like she needs to meet her grandmother. just an idea that we had together. We thought it would just be funny to do a record scratch. Very on the nose, but honestly, sometimes you just got to give into it. I think it's a cool thing to do. Now, after that, Ruby tricks Uncle Brill, right? But she does it through a genuine moment with him. So I wanted this shift in particular to feel very wholesome and from the heart. Ah. Uncle Brill, you have been more helpful than you can imagine. You know, this is the first hug we've had in 15 years. Then I'm really sorry. <laughs> For what? This. Right, so there's a little comedic button at the end of that. Um, that's sort of Uncle Brill's sound. It was like a little bit more classical, woodwind heavy, so I thought it was a cute little button to put on that. Another way of doing a moment like that is to just leave it alone. Just don't even do anything. It sort of speaks for itself. You know, in my opinion, I, I think with overt comedy music, um, it, it it's sometimes better with just like a very delicate hand. This is not one of those moments. However, I do often think if something's funny on the screen, you don't necessarily need to button it. This just worked for everybody and they were happy with it. Um, but regardless, it's sort of subvert, I was trying to subvert that joke, right? So by making this a very sweet moment, <sighs> uncle and niece you know, hugging. The first hug we've had in 15 years. I thought that was a fun way of doing it and then it's just, you know, flips it on its head. So this is again, just something, not necessarily just in animation, this is pretty much in any anything, um, just really trying to hone in on what those moments are doing emotionally, see if the music can heighten it, see if it can subvert it. That's the power of music, really. Music can be very manipulative, and I think that's something that composers have to play with. Now, I think that could scare a lot of directors because we can manipulate emotion so much, I think pretty much more so than any other part of the filmmaking process. I think we, and editors as well, can be so manipulative with what the audience's expectations are. So it's a, it's a fun tool to have, for sure, um, and I urge all of you to kind of explore the different dynamics of that. I know that some people are probably curious about what some of these sounds I'm using are. I really just use a lot of Spitfire libraries. Um, some of my favorites um, are these Albion Tundra and the Oliver Chamber strings, which I'm using in this section here, which I'll isolate for you. I just love how alive they sound. I love how unpredictable some of the tremolos are. It's just such an incredible tool I use on absolutely everything. Um, and I can just pop that open for you so you can see some of these super soltasto um, patches and then the chamber uh, trems as well. 
In this section, I actually combined the chamber string soltasto trim with the bass soltasto trim. So even though it's a really high part, you sort of get like the highest register of the bass, which gives it even more airiness to it. So I really love using that. Um, and I'm using lots of the chamber strings in this as well. Um, a lot of Albion brass that you'll hear in the next section too. So this is the action section that I was talking about, Ruby's chase to the end. So that moment where Ruby takes that big breath, I wanted to just be gone. I didn't want to score that breath. I wanted the audience to be drawn into that moment with her, taking a breath with her. This is such a big moment. And I didn't think that music needed to push that. I wanted to push the pace of her heart beating out of her chest running there and give her that moment of peace, preparing herself for going in. And there's just a big bass dive in there. Um, so what I'm doing here in the string part I have established this theme for Ruby, and you're, you heard it in the beginning of the cue on some like cool electroacoustic harp, which we'll talk about later as well. I still want to use Ruby's theme as much as I possibly can. So in this action section, the violins are doing that jumped fifth, which is what starts her theme. So right here. Right, so that's just kind of suggesting her theme, it's hinting at it. And then what I did was I took the short strings and in the inner voice of the viola part, I'm using that sort of directional part of her theme. Right, so that's the other part of the theme, so it kind of passes off. So you hear this. And it happens here too. So that's the sort of second phrase of Ruby's theme. So I, trying to use all of the sort of fodder I've created thematically, even if it's in these inner voices and you know, maybe the audience is none the wiser, you know, that's cool. But for me, I wanna just use that material as much as possible and develop it. Now, something interesting that I wanted to share, even though we're looking at the demo version of this, you know, my programmed version, I also brought in the final string stem, which includes the live strings that we recorded at Abbey Road. Now, call me crass. I always like to, in the mix, just bring in a little bit of the synth strings, some of the programming that I've done, because I really just feel like it creates even more depth and just sort of rounds out that sound really well. So here's an example of what the final string stem sounded like for this section. The live is obviously more at the forefront, and then the the programmed, like a lot of that Spitfire stuff is just tucked in the back. It gives this dimension to it. Take a listen. So you hear the bite of those live strings. We really got like a Sulpont thing happening in there with the with the spiccato. But still, like I love having that kind of bass, that sort of foundation from the samples as well. I think it just rounds out the sound really nicely. Same goes for the percussion. So all of the percussion in here, um, you know, there's like sticky percussion, there's bigger drums like toms and frame drums and tycos and things like that. I'll just solo the percussion so you can kind of hear what's happening. Um, I'm using a lot of the Hammers library. Thank you, Charlie Klauser, for being brilliant because I absolutely love using that stuff. Um, so here's the some of the percussion. Right, and I always like to put like a fat kick loop underneath it, sometimes more. So just have something really powerful and punchy in the bottom. And then, just so you can hear what it sounds like, we also recorded live percussion at Abbey Road. Here's a mix of those together. So those samples are still in there. Um, we're not hearing the kick because that's on a separate stem, but it just makes it even fatter. I just love it. I love mixing them together. It really just adds that, that sort of depth that I'm looking for. So once Ruby dives in the water, let's talk about the shifts that happen in there. Thank 
So my whole idea behind this was that I wanted to make it really ambient and ethereal. I wanted it to be slightly mysterious because we don't really know exactly what's going to happen. Once she goes under there, we know she's going to turn into a giant kraken, but is it going to be a moment where she can embrace herself or is it going to be something else? So I thought having that sort of sense of mystery in there was really important. And the way that I sort of captured that was through a lot of synth pads that I'm programming in here. Um, some of the electroacoustic harp, which I want to talk about in a little bit, really offered this kind of bubbly textural element, um, as did some of the guitars. Now this synth ostinato is something that I, weird story about that, I wasn't sure what this section needed, but I was really stressed and I decided to take the night off um, before diving into this cue. And my husband, John and I, who's the guitarist, decided to watch The Wall. Um, I am a big Pink Floyd fan and I had never seen The Wall, which is a shame, it's a crying shame. But we watched it and it blew my mind completely as I expected it to. Now, does that album have anything to do with the music I'm writing? No, not at all. But I came in here and I, wrote this section with this like really vibey kind of dark moody ostinato thing and if I didn't watch something the night before that I feel like really excited my imagination and inspired me to just like go to a different place I don't know if I would have ended up with it so that's just encouragement to just sometimes you know watch things that don't necessarily have to do with what you're doing and just challenge yourself creatively expose yourself to things um, that you wouldn't ordinarily. And so I sat down and I found this synth sound. And so synth arps kind of follow her around throughout the score. And so it kind of was a natural place to go, but having this more drawn out sort of moody feel like synth arp for this moment, I thought was both mysterious and kind of intriguing. Um, so yeah, I just like, I sat down and, and just recorded this part. So it follows the harmony when all of the when the track gets bigger. But I f I played it for the directors and they wanted to kind of push it off. So it it sort of it it captured like this one hit here. The close up of her. So once I came up with that sound, I thought, okay, I like the sound a lot, but I want to try layering it with other things too. So I found other sounds. I mean, this is this is the exploration phase, which I find to be the most fun. I was looking for synths that I felt really captured the style of what I was going for. I was looking for a lot of plugins, and plus there's a whole side of my screen you're not seeing right now, by the way, which is my mix window, which has all of these amazing inserts and sends and things like that. I'm using a lot of baby audio plugins on this, uh, like Spaced Out and Super VHS. It really helped nail that kind of um, dream pop vibe. So there's a lot of like degradation, like tape saturation, um, uh, just great multi-effects stuff, uh, modulation, things like that. So I started layering it with other things. That sound, this cool beach, beach house kind of thing. It's like a Prophet 5 sound. Um, these sort of flutters and keys. It's like lots of crystallizer on top to sort of make it feel like it's underwater. Some like higher, crispier synths that I knew were gonna kind of poke through. So basically, a lot of what I like to do is all about layering, essentially. So, um, you know, I programmed lots of synth pads for this section. I was using the Juno 60, um, which is uh, one of the best synths ever uh, to get those lush synth pads, layering that with a lot of um, some analog basses like the ATC and SE1 for those fat sounding basses like this. To get to give the music the scope it really needed, these are those Juno pads. And then you combine combine that with some of the other sounds as well.
Then the lead, which is Ruby's theme, I have layered on a ton of different kinds of synths. So you'll hear. Doubling that with electroacoustic harp and guitars and vocals. So it really just adds this richness and unique color to the music. So here's an example of what all of that stuff sounds like together. Right, and then we have the percussion. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. some great little electroacoustic harp run through uh, pedal effects stuff, which is uh, just really unlocked the sound of this score. So that's a bit of a deeper dive into this and just how I like to layer sounds and combine sounds. Um, I am constantly fixing my mixes, dialing in those uh, things that I've created layering things to make sure it's just sitting right and working well with the dialogue and the effects as well. So there's lots of underwater like low rumbly sounds in there too and I need to make sure that the music is not muddying that, that the music is existing in a space that's also complementing what the sound design is doing and making space for the dialogue like at the end there. Having talked about the compositional shape of this piece, I also really want to talk about the people who made this whole score what it is, and those are the soloists, the musicians that I worked with very closely on this. I worked very closely with John Monroe, guitarist, Emily Hopkins, who played electroacoustic harp, run through a bunch of effects pedals, Ari Mason, who is a vocalist, um, and invented this crazy Kraken language for this film, which the choir sang, and she's also singing a bit of in this as well. Um, Jake Baldwin, who uh, is a brass player, who I always send the most random things to his home and ask him to put his mouth on the instruments. In this case, it was a trombone didgeridoo and conch shells. He's not in this cue in particular, but he was a big part of the sound of the score. My work with soloists is so, so important because I feel like when you work with people who really think outside the box, you find this amazing, unique space to create something special. And that's certainly what I felt happened on the score. And um, certainly with John, who was on this project with me since the very, very beginning, he was playing all those guitars on that theme suite. So he was the very first person from start to finish, you know, to, to get through this project with me. So um, let's take a look at some of the things that he recorded on this. Thank you, John Monroe for that beautiful unplugged performance of the rubber bridge guitar <laughs> of Ruby Takes Control. I dragged you into this project the second I got hired, I feel like. And um, one of the first instruments we talked about was the rubber bridge guitar. I don't remember exactly when, but I feel like you were about to buy it and you played me a demo of it or something. Yeah, I found this online. Um, I read that Jeff Tweedy from Wilco owned about 13 of them. <laughs> They're basically uh, modded old 60s student guitars, that old style guitar shop in Silver Lake. Um, the owner, Reuben Cox, buys them, completely works them over, puts in a pickup, a piezo pickup, and replaces the bridge with a rubber bridge. So it is just a, a very dead sound. And we decided early on it would be cool to try and basically replace a ukulele with this. So that's more or less how it functions on the album. Yeah, it like I heard it and it definitely felt just like a really big ukulele and it was such an intimate sound and I liked that the different pickups allowed for different, so we could lean different ways with it, which I thought was really fun. Um, I definitely always, we've worked together on a lot of things and I feel like every single thing you have acquired in your studio, I'm always like, hey, can you, can you record that for me? It was a recurring theme with this <laughs> where I'd buy this and play it for stuff, very excited about how it sounds, and she says, can you record that tomorrow? I say, sure. But a 12-string acoustic, I was recording it the day it came. How many instruments do you think you recorded on the score? I think we counted yesterday, it was 13. What were they? It was every guitar I owned, so every electric <laughs> guitar. Um, 12-string electric, 12-string acoustic, 6-string acoustic, the rubber bridge, pedal steel, bass, baritone guitar, omnichord. I think that, that was it. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty wild because 
even if things don't sound overtly like that's a guitar, I mean, in this cue, they have those moments and there's those great exposed moments with a rubber bridge, which do just kind of draw you in. Um, and I love how you can hear the sound of the instrument, it's so tactile. And then there are a lot of other things in here, which I'll solo for you, that are very atmospheric, that are very textural, um, and it really just, it, it adds these layers to the sound. It, it creates this great meaning in it. And so it was really fun to collaborate together from start to finish. Um, we were talking about 80s guitar tones, like the, the Cure that typically has a lot of chorus on it. And yeah. me being me, I decided to fight actually using chorus for a while. So I would try to find ways to get a chorusing effect, either naturally just by using 12 strings or rotary speaker. Mm -hmm or just degrading the sound like with a generation loss by Chase Bliss. Uh -huh. This was very good for that too because each pickup has an independent output and I would mic it. So I would get the clean sound of the mic, which sounds like a ukulele, and then run the other two through different pedals. Yeah. And we would get some sort of layer of the three sounds. Yeah, and you'll see at the top of my sequence that I basically just have a marker's track specifically for guitar ideas. So it's not the easiest thing in the world to mock up guitar. <laughs> uh, the you know it's it's a tough thing, especially because there's so many different kinds of techniques that you can use. So I think part of our collaboration was me kind of marking like, okay, I do want this strummy sort of rubber bridge thing here. I want these really rich guitar chords here. Can we try doubling the lead on a higher guitar and I could just like put a sort of high pass filter on it or something like that and then crunch it up and distort it and do something to it. But just having John's performance on stuff gave me so much inspiration to just break out of my comfort zone because dream pop is very hard to mock up, right? So working with you was just such a crucial part of the process as well as with Emily Hopkins on the electroacoustic harp where she used so many effects pedals that also captured that sound of being underwater and Ari Mason on vocals as well, who who just brought that, you know, that human voice to uh, Ruby in a musical way. So let's isolate some of John's electric guitar, rubber bridge guitar, 12 string guitar stems here so we can kind of hear them on their own. So that's what he played in the room for you, and you can hear how I have made it louder so that it's a little bit more present, but really having that tactile sort of sensitivity to how quiet the instrument is, um, I love that you can hear the characteristics of it. So these are with his um, guitars as well, the electric guitars in here. <laughs> And then the next section, which was also a bit of a lo-fi feel, you can really just hear those low, those slow rakes and plucks. And then as we get later into the cue, when she dives underwater, he did this great little fluttering. Which again, it's just all about creating this texture, creating this level of immersion. And then here's some of his others on the leads. Bright 12 string breaks. And then some atmospheres in there as well. It's the sense of being very washy. And then he's doubling on the melody, but because, as you saw, the melody is being doubled on so many other synths and harp and vocals, it's kind of just one piece of the puzzle. Right, so it seems, it sounds a little rinky-dinky, but that's very intentional because I needed something that was very articulated to come out in the mix when it's so full and, and thick. So that brightness and that sort of nasal tone that doesn't have a lot of sustain, it helped punctuate the, the melody. So in addition to John's guitars, I wanted to show you a little bit of Emily Hopkins, who is this brilliant electroacoustic harpist. She recorded a bunch on this cue and the rest of the score as well. So I wanted to just isolate how wonderful she is, not just as a performer, not just her musicianship, but just her and um, her partner Russ, his the, the how they curated these sounds with a bunch of effects pedals. So here are some of the things that she recorded. So this is the variation on Ruby's theme. 
using some of those Chase Bliss pedals that John was also using, the generation loss, which is sort of just this, it degrades the sound, it makes it feel like it's, it's being run through tape. This very fast arpeggiated thing for Ruby's run, it just like adds this sense of energy. And then let's take a listen to these, creating the underwater atmosphere. So Emily ran her harp through the microcosm, which is this brilliant granular looper, and it really kind of unlocked the sound of the score. It just sounds like very unpredictable, very organic, very bubbly. So having those textures in here with all of those other layers of the cue that you've already heard, it just gave it something that was so special, it unlocked something. This is her doubling Ruby's theme. Right, so it's it's not traditional. It's not a traditional harp, and I think so much of those colors and those timbres and the the way that it interacts with John's guitars and the orchestra, all of that, it just ex it exists in a different space, like a unique space, and that's really what I wanted for Ruby. While we're here, I just want to point out Ari Mason, who did the vocals on here. She sang on Ruby's theme at the end here and sings throughout the entire score. <sighs> So she did invent this Kraken language, which is basically a combination of kind of random syllables with Old Norse. And that's because the earliest history or story of someone witnessing a Kraken happened sort of in the Scandinavian area quite early on. Um, so the Old Norse was kind of pulled in from that language and that, um, that region. So it was very cool to see that just kind of tucked in here. It's not really at the forefront in this cue, but see how that developed and how the big choir sang on it towards the end of the film with these like big battle sequences. So now that we've uncovered a lot of those really unique soloist performances, let's go back to the beginning, take a listen to the final version one last time, keeping all of those little tricks and tips in mind for how to build bigger sequences, how to find and carve out space for themes, how to immerse the audience um, in these environments to make it a really meaningful and impactful viewing experience for them. Land is not built for a giant kraken. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's not. I don't know the first thing about being a giant kraken. It's not fair to keep me in the dark. Nope, not at all. I can't keep waiting for answers. I need to take control of my own life. You go, girl. I'm a kraken. Preach. And if I want answers, then there's only one person who can help me. Your mom. My grandmother. Yeah. No, what? I can't let you do that. Oh. Your mom will kill me. <sighs> <sighs> Uncle Brill, you have been more helpful than you can imagine. <sighs> you know, this is the first hug we've had in 15 years. Then I'm really sorry. <laughs> For what? This. Oh, a stick snack! I hope you enjoyed that deep dive into this cue from Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken. I always find that just learning a little bit about somebody else's compositional process can be really eye-opening. I used to work for Harry Gregson Williams, who I'm sure a lot of you know, especially at Spitfire, and I feel like I learned the most just from studying his sequences and understanding how he layered sounds. So I hope just by giving you this little glimpse into this, it demystifies the process of scoring, it shows you how 
much dimension that you can get out of using sample libraries, out of working with specialist soloists to sort of broaden your horizons. This score in particular was a bit of a departure for me. Um, I had never written dream pop music before, and it was really out of my comfort zone on this one. And I feel like when I started, I didn't really know how. And I think by just taking some risks, finding people to work with who were happy to sort of take this, jump off this ledge with me and discover what the sound world was, that helped me so much and it really excited and sparked my imagination. I really hope that some of you can go and see Ruby Gilman Teenage Kraken. It's streaming now on Peacock. I also encourage you to check out another behind the scenes video that I did with the harpist Emily Hopkins on her YouTube page. You can find that link in the description below. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed.